slides. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah we can. I can see it perfectly. Okay, perfect. Okay, we are live. Um, hey, everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're here with Katie. As you can see, she's in her office joining us during her lunch break. So we really appreciate her taking the time out of her super busy day to do this. Um, yeah. I'm going to try and not cut into this as much as possible. So Katie, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and start. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining me today. Um, I know times are, like, super tough with all this COVID business going on and no shadowing going on or very little shadowing. Some students are lucky in finding some shadowing still. Um, I'm someone that takes a lot of shadows, not a lot, but I have to limit it because I do a lot of precepting as well. Um, so I usually take pre PAs that are interested in shadowing um, about once a month, but since like March, everything has been closed down. We've started students back up um, on rotation, but they haven't been allowed to have shadows back in the hospital yet. Um, so unfortunately I have had to turn down a lot. So I feel your pain because I know how important it is. Um, when I was a pre-PA student, just trying to get shadowing hours and I was able to I think shadow two or three different um, PAs when I was um, in your position. So I hear you, but please know that I think Schools are going to also have to understand um, as long as everyone is continuing to do what they can to improve their application. Um, you know, always work on that GPA and then stuff like this um, is super nice that you can actually, if you do the quiz at the end, um, get at least a certificate of attendance and then um, at least something you can put on an application that you're doing the best you can with these times to um, learn what you can about the peer profession and deciding if it's right for you within the limitations of not being able to really show up and see us. So thank you all for joining me. We'll get started here. Disclosures, um, don't really have any, these are all my own and do not represent my employer whatsoever. So I'm Katie. I've been a physician assistant for 10 years now, which is pretty crazy. It's been going, gone super fast for the most part. Um, a little bit of my background. So I um, was pretty young actually when I decided on the PA profession. I was like a junior to senior in high school actually. Um, I think I was looking at colleges and had seen something about this pre-PA route and started looking at it more and decided it was something I was definitely interested in pursuing more. Um, so I know I understand a lot of people are not in that boat and a lot of you are probably already in undergrad just trying to figure out um, what to do. So I um, ended up going straight from um, high school. I went and attended University of Wisconsin Superior. When I was there, I did a biology degree uh, major and then chemistry and psych minors and don't get me wrong like I definitely doubted myself at times and my first like bio and chem heavy semester I had a total freak out and like got a C and something C plus and I'm like there's no way I will never get into PA school this is all wrong what, are, what was I thinking um so I changed my whole major for a semester, switched it to like health something. Um, I'm not even sure and started taking these other classes. Um, finally composed myself after a while, um, a couple months and realized, you know, I don't, you know, I want to be a PA still. Why am I like doubting myself so much? So um, switched my major back to biology and um, worked really hard and um, went back into uh, those classes that I did not do so well in and improved my grade, at least one of them. Um, worked hard to catch up as far as staying on the, my best way that I found um, to keep my grades up was to not overdo myself and try and take like, you know, 20 credits a semester or something like that. I really needed um, to focus on that. So, and because I was also working part-time um, 
trying to obviously get those healthcare hours in as much as I could. I think I worked like as a point four, um, like 24 hours a week or something as a first as a nursing assistant. And then um, I really wanted to work in the hospital because I knew I could find some PAs in the hospital basically. Um, so I started at a nursing home and then I, so this was all like, I think I started at the nursing home like my senior year of high school and then eventually got in to a hospital. Um, it took me a good year or two of some experience till they even take me. Um, I was working as a patient transport orderly, which is like also a nursing assistant type of position, wheeling patients to their like x-rays and CT scan and lab and um, we also had the opportunity, which was helpful, especially for me to get some more hands-on. Um, we were on the code, so if there was like a, a cardiac arrest um, in the hospital, we would be the ones that would have to show up and perform the CPR on the patient while the team was running the code. Um, also involved in the trauma team, so if there was a trauma that came into the emergency room, we'd get the stat page to go and get the blood from the lab and bring that down and go down and help out the trauma surgeon with whatever they can. Most of it was like trying to get clothes off so they can get accurate imaging um, and just seeing how all that works, helping get patients quickly to the CT scan if there was concern for like brain injuries and stuff like that, being able to sit and watch the CT scan. So it was really good experience being in the hospital. And then I was also able to meet a couple of PAs um, by you know, approaching them and telling them I was really interested in the profession and um, asking for the opportunity to shadow them, which I was um, able to do as well. Um, so that was most of my undergrad, trying to get as much of that experience as I could while going to school. Um, I spent some summers doing some of my chemistry um, at University of Minnesota. It was more just you know, I didn't care for the chemistry program I was in and um, wanted to do well in my program. So I um, decided to just concentrate on that because it was really challenging to me. Um, so I decided to just focus on my whole chemistry minor throughout my four years. Well, it would have been three summers and get all that done so I could um, get good grades in it um, and just concentrate on that during the summer. So, you know, everyone just kind of has to do what works for them um, and everything's gonna be a little different for everyone. The psych minor was something that as I was looking at schools, I saw all of the, wrote down of course, all the prerequisites I have had to take in order to apply to like my four different schools I wanted to, I was interested in um, and realized I'm like, you know what, I have to take like one more class and I have a psych minor so I might as well just do that as well, which I really enjoyed um, psychology classes as well. So that's a little background. So like I said, I um, applied to four PA schools. Um, I ultimately decided to go to Des Moines University down in Iowa. Um, so keep in mind, I went to PA school 10 years ago. Um, being in the Midwest in uh, the Minnesota area, there was only one PA school at the time. Today, there's, I think, five now um, with the Mayo Clinic starting up. I'm not sure if they have started yet or they will be soon. Um, so that's how much it's grown as far as the schools go. Um, and I think I did a couple interviews and really liked the feel for Des Moines. Um, I did not get into every one. There was that's why I always encourage people to apply to multiple different, multiple different schools because every school is kind of looking for something different. Um, there was one, I just got a rejection letter right away. Um, I think three of them asked for an interview. One of them I was waitlist, waitlisted at. Um, and then I went to Des Moines and loved it and accepted it. And then actually declined an interview at the last um, School because I decided um, that, was, that one wasn't right for me and I had already decided to go to Des Moines. Um, oh, also during my senior year of high school, just to further try and get more um, medical hours that I could add to my application, although I think I had already accepted a position 
um, at Des Moines, like my senior year of undergrad. Um, I went on and did an internship in the coronary intensive care unit, which I was able to like wrap in as um, to my like senior project in uh, undergrad, which was a great experience as well. So why did I choose the PA profession? Um, I always found like the medical school, or the medical um, study like completely fascinating. I really enjoy taking care of people. I've always kind of been that type of person, I guess. Um, I was sort of, you know, thinking nursing, like I never really um, thought about being a physician, to be honest with you. there I know there are a lot of people that go back between med school or PA school. Um, and I always knew physician wasn't for me given the hours, um, the length of time for the training. And um, I wasn't really intrigued by the lifestyle, I guess you could say, with working long hours and being, um, you know, many, many years of schooling with residency joined and just knowing all of the um, traveling you'd have to do between medical school, going away for residency. Um, I kind of like my my Midwest and staying hanging out between um, you know Minnesota, Wisconsin is my home. Um, so even 12, uh, 12 hours to Iowa was a distance for me, but I was obviously willing willing to do it. Um, so I was thinking nursing. So I did, like I said, started working at a nursing home, but then I quickly realized that um, well, to be honest with you, it probably wasn't a good representation of nurses because they just pass a lot of medication. Um, so I kind of saw that. I'm like, you know what? I just want to be more involved in like the actual like um, patient care and in ordering and interpreting these labs because I always had to know like, well, why are they taking this? Well, why do we need to do this? And things um, that I wanted to know more about, more about the diagnosis and the treatment plans and be more involved in that decision making. So. Um, I found the PA profession to be just like exactly what I was looking for. I did not ever want to be that person that's a complete final say in everything like a physician. I'm perfectly happy um, helping patients as much as I can, but you know what? There's gonna, there are difficult situations where sometimes you just want another person's um, advice or the final say in. Um, so I, I have that every day, which has been wonderful. Um, not to mention all the medical stuff, I found the actual lifestyle of the PA something that was more in line with what I wanted. Um, I always envis envisioned myself having a family at a young age. Um, and I feel like the PA profession has been able to give me a really nice work-life balance. I know some people say the work-life balance doesn't exist, but um, in a way it really does as far as like how much time are you at work versus how much time are you home and not having to worry about your work and what's going on at work or who's taking care of your patients. Um, I have really, I think, pretty nice work hours now. Um, I have a family. I have two kids and a husband. Um, and we enjoy a lot of outdoor activities year round. I enjoy being able to take my family, you know, on a vacation once a year, maybe not last year, maybe not this year or next year, I should say, um, with COVID era. But um, those are the type of lifestyle I wanted. Um, and that's kind of what I, why I really geared more towards the PA profession. Clearly, we do not you probably already um, looked around, but we do not make the salary of a physician. And I was well aware of that. And I was not concerned about that. Um, we make a decent decent living, that's for sure. Um, some PAs might work a lot more than others. It's gonna vary tremendously based on specialty and even just based on your workplace and just based on kind of what's going on, um, different seasons for some people. Sometimes we're shorthanded, you know, if someone else is out on leave, we're picking up extra work. So sure, it kind of um, varies from 
time to time or month to month, we have our really busy times and we have times that might slow down a little bit. Um, so as far as my specialty goes, why I chose that, so general surgery, you may know this already, but in PA school, you're going to have your didactic and then you will have your clinical rotation year or you know maybe longer than a year, 14, 15 months, somewhere around there. You're gonna have your core rotations and surgery is one of your core rotations. Let's say majority of students have general surgery, but some are in any type of surgery that they can get them in. It doesn't have to be general from, from what I'm aware of. Um, so I became interested in surgery pretty young because I was shadowing cardiothoracic surgery PAs when I was um, in undergrad. I had a few opportunities and got to watch open heart and it was completely fascinating. So I was able to get, arrange to get back um, and do a clinical rotation with them during my um, clinical year. And alongside that, I also had a general surgery rotation as it was one of our core rotations. So I was able to, to do both and experience both. Um, I enjoyed the um, cardiothoracic surgery rotation as anticipated, but I um, found general surgery more, I like the variety of general surgery more as far as the case cases go. Um, there's so many different areas of the body you might be operating on, but majority of general surgery is with the abdomen, okay? So a lot of it is like the gallbladders and the appendix, some of the most common operations that you see, you know, in the nation. Um, but not only that, it's a lot of colon cancers that we're dealing, um, treating um, other conditions of the colon like diverticulitis. We help patients with inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease, um, ulcerative colitis. Um, I've helped with some big uh, operations, including of the liver, the pancreas, the spleen, nearly everything in the abdomen. I'd say um, when it comes to the kidneys, that's usually separate, a urology type of specialty. Um, thyroid and parathyroid falls into some of the... Um, general surgeons who are trained in endocrine, uh, breast cancers, breast surgery for uh, women, well, and men, but mostly majority of women that falls into general surgery, which I've been able to be a big part of. A um, lot of skin cancers, not the small ones, certainly is more dermatology. If they're in a cosmetic place, that's typically plastic surgery. But sometimes we get some bad skin cancers where we have to remove a lot of um, tissue or do lymph node sampling in that area or remove lymph nodes. So that typically falls into the general surgery category as well. So you can see such the variety, which I really like the most about it. There's so many different organs you need to know very well. Um, and I love anatomy and the human body. And it absolutely still amazes me even after all these years, because they're all different. And it's, um, Pretty cool to see that on a day-to-day -day basis in the operating room. So it's mostly the variety, I'd say, of why I chose general surgery. I fell in love with it during rotations, and I was lucky enough where I guess I impressed my preceptors and the surgeons enough where they hired me back as soon as I was done with PA school um, and started working. And I should note, too, I get a lot of questions about surgical residency, which most of you probably already been thinking about if you're pre-PA, but, um, you know, it's kind of one of those things where, like, I wasn't ever completely against it. I was very interested in surgery. I knew that and said, well, I might as well try and get a job first and get on the job training. Um, if I'm not able to get a job first, then I certainly will look at doing a surgical residency um, to improve my application. So it might be something that comes more and more popular with um, maybe some demand going up, I guess you could say. So I guess time will kind of tell. Um, so out of the past 10 years, I've been in general surgery the entire time. Um, I've had two different jobs of like two different healthcare systems within the same city. Um, right now I'm, I'm not like five years 
my first five years and now it's been like my second five years. Um, so I've been involved in a lot of different subspecialties because so you have general surgery, but then certain surgeons might be special fellowship trained in areas, even though they're in the general surgery department, we might work amongst them. Um, so some specialties I've been involved in is uh, surgical oncology. That was my first five years, um, which I learned a ton on. It's a lot of um, operating and especially some pretty big operations on patients. Um, I also helped out with some bariatric surgery at that time um, and still have been until recently. So bariatric surgery is weight loss surgery. Um, a lot of people might think about it as like the ruin y gastric bypass or the lap bands or the sleeve gastrectomies. I've helped with all, all of those many times. Um, colorectal surgery, so that specially trained colorectal surgeon, which I've really enjoyed and I've worked with the colorectal surgeon until recently, the past five years almost. Um, it's a lot of colon cancers. Um, diverticulitis, some complicated um, abdominal conditions with inflammatory bowel disease that we help patients with. Um, and then trauma surgery is something that was new to me. Um, I was not doing my first five years. So when I transitioned to a different position, um, we help with trauma management. Trauma surgery honestly happens, happens a lot at night. Um, where they might come in in the middle of the night and um, be admitted or sometimes go to the, operate, the operating room. So the actual surgery that I'm involved in in trauma is not a ton because typically it doesn't, hap doesn't happen during the day as frequently and I'm not at a huge trauma center. Um, but I help follow patients throughout the hospital with management. As far as the operations I've been in, it's pretty limited, mostly helping them get out of the hospital um, based on their injuries. Um, overall, I'd say surgery definitely gives a faster gratification compared to other specialties in medicine, um, which I like. I mean, maybe I'm just not a patient enough person, um, but I, that's what you're going to find as you're going through rotations. Um, some people tend to enjoy the clinic setting where things are a little slower pace as far as you're going to, you know, notice maybe there's someone with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, maybe talk them through modifications or prescribe a new medication, but you're going to see them back in three months, typical, and see how they're doing with that. Um, so it's a completely different pace where in surgery, um, we can go in knowing someone has a nasty cancer and do an operate do an operation on them um, and know that, you know, everything went really well and we got all the cancer that we could see out and now um, just got to wait for results. So that's always really gratifying to be able to say that you helped with that and all in the matters of a day work, um, just getting them out of the hospital safely at that point. Um, same with pain, there's different types of pain or acute types of pain like gallbladder and appendix um, that can come up with someone completely unexpected. I live in an area that's kind of heavy on tourists. So we end up with a lot of tourists that end, might land in the hospital here with something acute that we can fix and then get them home safely, you know, within a day or two. So um, I love, I really like the variety of it as well because I'm jumping every day pretty much um, between the hospital, the clinic, and the operating room. Typically, um, if you look at my schedule, it looks all nicely set out where I have my clinic days and my operating room days. But in reality, I come in and I really have like no idea what's going to go on that day. I might like literally have almost very little, little things on my schedule and come in and be packed busy for 10 hours straight um, just with things that come up. My surgeons are on call. So constantly getting new patients in or like last minute text, hey, I'm heading to the OR with this patient. Can you please come help me? And um, so, yeah, I love the variety and I kind of am not a big stick to a strict schedule type of person. You kind of have to be easygoing because you're not going to ever know what's going to come up. Um, 
you can plan your day out perfectly and look at your schedule, but it's never going to really follow that. You're going to be running between the hospital and the clinic. You're going to get calls from the nurses on the floor as I'm in the clinic about something that needs to be taken care of right now. You'll get called to the operating room. Um, so yeah, I kind of like that. It's not for everyone. Some people like the schedule and that's typically more of a clinic setting, st sticking to that. Not, you know, not that stuff doesn't happen in the clinic at all. They're sending patients to the ER or admitting them too unexpectedly, but um, so the not so great things. I always like to be honest and, you know, with even people applying to positions as far as what I don't like about um, surgery. Um, I've certainly gotten used to it, but it can be a lot of um, standing for long hours at a time. Um, some cases you might go in when the average of this case is going to take, oh, I should be done in about three hours, maybe four, if it's challenging. Six, seven hours later, you're just getting out. So it can be very um, uh, like that, just not really knowing what's going to happen. Um, you have to be okay with that. And sometimes you, especially now for me with the family, found that challenging at first on how to handle that. Um, because if I can't, can't be there or be somewhere where I'm supposed to be, it's uh, a lot of asking, asking favors, asking the nurses in the operating room to call my husband and see if he can pick up the kids. I can't do that anymore. Like, like the plan was and stuff like that. So that can get challenging. Um, you're unavailable when you're in the operating room. Like I said, that could be three hours, six hours, seven hours. You're completely unavailable besides your pager for the, for the most part in case there's any emergencies that come up or if the nurses need you on the floor for something they can page in. Um, but you're not available, you know, if someone from the outside is trying to get a hold of you, you don't have your cell phone on you. So um, that can be hard sometimes too, but um, it's just a different modification and way of living, I guess you could say. Um, there's certainly been always challenging cases that come up that can be hard, um, particularly with me, more like young people, or I swear some of the most wonderful people I've ever met end up with these awful cancers and there's just not a lot that we can do um, to help them. And you're gonna find that in medicine in any area, you're gonna run into situations that are extremely challenging like that for you mentally. Um, trying to think that. So I'd say those are the probably the big things that that stick out for me as far as um, the challenging things in the sur surgery and surgical subspecialties. Um, beyond being a PA, you know, I try to do other work related PA type stuff to help out as much as I can. Like I said, I take. Um, I precept students, majority is PA students. I've certainly taken, uh, I think one nurse practitioner just because that's the only request I've had through the years. Um, and then I help alongside the med students who are typically with the surgeons, but lots of times they end up with the PAs as well if we're um, you know, closing or I'm trying to help them uh, get to a different operating room or help them with surgery founding, gloving, stuff like that. Most are four to six weeks in length. I also help with some suturing sessions on the side. I have a picture over here of me helping out the local uh, med students. We did a big suturing lab with pig's feet. Um, I do some guest lecturing for the local PA class here in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, I'm also at work on the APC council meeting, advanced um, practice cl clinicians. So the we represent the physician assistants and the nurse practitioners at our facility and um, work with like administration to um, make sure they're using us to our ability and utilizing us um, and do everything we can just to stay in communication with them and let them know what we need and what they need from us and just good communication overall and relay that on to the other people. Um, the other PAs and NPs in the group of what's going on with those meetings and sending them minutes. Um, I'm also on the education committee here, which helps arrange for all the CME for the providers, for the physicians, the PAs and the NPs, and help deciding um, where most people are looking to get more education that the 
um, health system can can provide for us. Uh, more recently, I've also been involved with the surge planning for our COVID. So I was tasked uh, back in March with a pretty big project to um, get in contact with all with the PAs and NPs within our um, uh, health system, which was quite a, I think we have like 80 or something like that. I can't remember. And um, figure out who can mobilize to different areas with the surge. And mostly the, the biggest needs certainly are hospital medicine, as well as the um, emergency room. Um, so we're actually just revisiting those plans this week and coming up with a plan and actually having some people on call for both of those um, areas now coming next week with the hospitals getting um, busier with COVID and non-COVID both areas. So it's good um, to be involved in different areas. I'd say as a new grad, concentrate on your job. Um, but with time, try and add more and more to help out your community, help out the PA profession, help out students in general. Um, there's a lot of things that you can be very involved in. So kind of pick Pick what you enjoy um, and it definitely helps you know with uh, your career um my schedule so as i said my schedule is i kind of break it up into my first five years as a pa and then my past five years as a pa is i kind of made a pretty big change not super big because i'm still doing general surgery excuse me um, so my first five years as a new PA, I took a position where we soon um, were taking call. I think start but very soon started taking call. I was working Monday through Friday, and then we had to rotate call between somewhere between four and six different PAs and NPs, depending upon how many we had that and covered, including nights, um, rotating weekends, and rotating holidays. And it was completely fine. I really actually am very thankful for that opportunity because there is so much you can learn in the middle of the night at 2 a.m. and there's so much you can see at that time that you're not going to see during the day. Um, so many different cases I recall being at that I still think back to that I saw eight years ago or something like that and helped over overall um, I think with my career and knowledge base and all that. So I don't regret that at all. It was wonderful. It was great. Um, but then I started having kids <laughs> and it, it changes things. It definitely does. I never really thought about it until it just happened. And I'm, you know, getting called in at 2 a.m. And, um, you know, I don't know when I'll be home. I don't know if I'll be home to help with the morning routine, you know, so it kind of just got to be a little too much on me and my family. Um, and at the right time where an opportunity came up, where they were looking for a general surgery PA with just Monday through Friday um, without all that call. Um, so I took the opportunity um, and I've been here since. It's been good for my family lifestyle, definitely, where I don't have to be here late at night. I'm not here on the weekends. We've certainly helped out from time to time when the surgeons were extremely shorthanded on the weekends, but um, it's not part of my contract whatsoever. And we also have like seven paid holidays completely off. So that's been great also not have to plan all my family stuff around certain holidays that I'm working on. Um, I definitely average about probably 40 hours a week. I say average because it just depends on the busy time. Um, surgery honestly tends to get a little busier towards the end of the year. Um, because people have like health deductibles and if they've already used some, they kind of want to use it up. Otherwise they might get stuck with like thousands of dollar bill um, come like January, February, which is hard on anyone. Um, and we have some lighter, so my lighter weeks, you know, maybe 35 hours if I'm lucky, I can try and get out of here by three, but definitely heavier weeks kind of balance it out. So it's not necessarily like week to week. It's more like season to season, I'd say. Um, I'm in a salary position. You'll find the majority of surgical PAs are salary position. What does that mean? It just means I'm not paid hourly. I have a salary where um, that's my salary for the entire year and I'm there when they need me and it doesn't, they don't track um, 
my exact, you know, hours from day to day or week to week. I don't like have to swipe in and swipe out like I did when I was like a nursing assistant. Um, usually I start around seven. And like I said, we never know when we'll be done. I might, you know, be able to get out of here by three. It might not be till five-ish. It just kind of depends what's going on and how much uh, they need me. And every single PA or surgical PA you ask is going to say some, something completely different than what I've seen. So just know that um, nothing is super normal. Everyone's going to have a different schedule for the most part. So my days typically start with morning rounds. Um, it's pretty standard in surgery. I cover one to two surgeons, two surgeons right now, average about four to six patients. But if someone's just on call, like the night before, we might have closer to 10. Usually I try in pre-round and see all the patients before the surgeon and get all the um, plan made for the day and maybe getting orders in. Um, sometimes we'll just round together depending upon if they need to be somewhere or not. Um, most of these patients, it's nice because I actually help with their operations. So I can answer a lot of the questions they have. Lots of times I might be the first one to see them the day after surgery and they have all these questions. So I can answer a majority of those because um, I was right there, which is really nice for patient care and continuity of care. You, you'll hear a lot about, um, which is great. Um, so I'm typically doing a problem focus, history and physical, um, diagnosing things that come up, treating it, um, lab work, ordering different labs, you know, that may um, need to be ordered based on their symptoms um, that they're having or this operation they had. Um, the most common radiographs is probably x-rays and CT scans. Um, I'll place, you know, orders for the nursing orders or medication orders, um, diet activity, all that. Uh, lots of counseling and education for patients, especially um, regarding their operation and what they can expect postoperatively, what's normal pain, what's not normal pain, um, all that kind of stuff, just to make sure that when they go home, um, they know when to call us when there's something of concern and when something's for the most part expected. I'll do a note on them. So note, you'll learn all about that in PA school, how to write notes. Um, and then after rounds, you know, sometimes it might take a half hour if we don't have a lot. Sometimes it could take a couple hours. Um, usually I'm off to the operating room or the clinic, depending on the day and the schedule. In the operating room, this is challenging to really um, talk about until you really see it on rotations. Um, so most PAs take on the first assist role. Um, so what I do, I try to get there early if I can, if I'm not, do, if I can get sneak out of rounds, um, help get the patient position, answer questions to the sur surgical technologists or nurses about any further instruments or equipment they might need. Then I'll go and scrub in, um, which is, you know, washing up your hands really thoroughly, usually about five minutes. Um, mask, gown, gloves, Sarah um, which usually the surgical techs will help us with. And then my first assist duties, um, typical is like suctioning blood, retracting different tissue, handling, all that. Um, now, this is a big part as far as the surgical PA profession. I feel like the more you're in it um, and the more you work with a particular surgeon, um, the more advancements you'll make in your career and have the ability to essentially do more and be more involved. It's not something you're going to do your first year as far as some of the more advanced um, things. It comes with time. It comes with experience. It comes with trust from the surgeon, definitely. So um, some of them that I've worked many years with, they'll have me make incisions and place ports for like laparoscopic and robotic surgery. Um, they might have me fire the stapler, putting clips on bleeding vessels or tying them off, cauterizing, helping them really do a lot of the dissection and very hands-on. Um, for the most part, I say this, when you've done enough procedures with the same surgeon, it's like a really great dance where you really don't have to talk to each other. You just kind of have your rhythm down. I know exactly my role um, and how they need my help. So they don't have to like tell you every single thing to do next. Um, that would probably really annoy them if it had to be with every uh, case. So um, it's a benefit 
um, definitely to have someone that really knows their routine. And at the end, I'm closing, I'm suturing up the incisions. Um, majority of the time I have a sidekick student with me, so I always have them help me do it. Um, we'll split them up if it's if there's like five or six ports to suture close, um, or if it's a big long one, we might split it. Um, sometimes, you know, surgeons I've worked with for many years, they might have me close like multiple layers of the abdominal wall, the thick fascia. Um, so sometimes the surgeon will be um, be done with the bulk of the operation and leave me to close up so they can go talk to family and kind of get the next patient ready to roll, visit with them. So then I'm there in the operating room, finishing closing up and um, getting dressings on. And um, so, yeah, that's something that kind of comes with time too, that they need to build trust in you if they're going to leave you in the operating room to finish things up. Um, so I think I, I have some links of a few examples that if you guys would like to watch them, um, the pre-PA pals, I think are going to share them to one of their, um, or on the link of this. Um, I just put in a few things of an example of my surgical scrub. Um, it's like a really long, boring, but just an example of what we're doing every day. An example of one of the most common sutures that we throw in the operating room, example of not tying all things that we do. Obviously you can't see all that. So I just wanted to provide you with examples. A lot of these are on um, my Instagram um, IGTV page as well. Um, and then I also have an example. I found on YouTube a common operation I help with called a laparoscopic sigmoid. Um, it's a procedure we do oftentimes for a colon cancer or diverticulitis. And I liked it because it shows um, how closely we are working with the surgeon and handling tissue. Um, it was more so just to watch the assistant part of it if you wanna see more what the PA's role is as opposed to the surgeon in the operating room because it's uh, pretty common what we're doing. I'm also involved in uh, robotic surgery, um, which is pretty fun, I'd say. Um, so the surgeon is usually at the council where the PA as well as the tech are over by the patient actually. Um, we are helping like exchange instruments and then usually I'll have an assistant port to actually retract tissue, um, suction blood, all that kind of stuff. It's uh, definitely a learning curve for sure. It's, um, I've been doing it you know, now since for several, probably like eight or nine years. Um, it's you know pretty straightforward and simple to me, but I'm kind of training new PAs at it now. I'm like, oh wow, this is a lot to learn, and I just kind of take it for granted that I've just been doing it for so many years. It's you know natural type stuff for me. Um, so it's definitely a learning curve, but it's fun. Um, technology is always fun um, to be a part of, and seeing that advancement in medicine is it's always crazy to me to think that this stuff is going to be like so outdated someday. So. These cases, you kind of have to be on your toes, especially if it's a um, case that you could run into trouble quickly because um, a surgeon needs to trust you. If they're, if you run into a lot of bleeding that they cannot be controlled, which has happened before, um, I've had to hurry up, disconnect the entire robot, um, get it off the field, and then try to, um, and, and as the surgeon is trying to scrub in so that we can get control of the bleeding. And I've been asked before also, like, if you need to make a big incision and open the abdomen, I need you to do that. So um, definitely something that comes with experience, but you have to be on your toes and, um, you know, always aware of what's going on. Um, my clinic days. So most of the time it's about 70% of surgical follow-ups. Most of them I see a couple weeks after the operation based on the surgery. It's a problem focused history and physical check out incisions. If there's drains, sutures, or staples to remove, I'll do that. Most of the time I'll let the PA student um, do that while I'm there in the room with them. Um, sometimes if I'm concerned about an infection or something else going on, I might order additional labs or imaging. Um, paperwork, not obviously the funnest part, but 
Lots of paperwork, back to work slips for a lot of patients who had surgery, um, refilling prescriptions, and just helping sending and coordinating um, consults within the office. Um, I don't do these minor procedures as much anymore, but um, at my previous job, we were pretty heavily involved in these. Um, they had a little procedure room in the clinic where we would do incision and drainage, um, remove um, little cysts in the office, skin cancers, um, little lipomas, which are little like fatty tumors. Um, patients who had lap bands for weight loss, we'd um, have to access those. It's placing a needle through the abdomen to access a port and remove fluid or add fluid um, just to help them with early satiety as far as how much they're eating. Um, we have a lot of patients with feeding tubes, which I might remove as well. Here's some examples here of um, common drains that we see, staples versus sutures, little biopsy there commonly for like skin cancer. Here's an example of an abscess we might drain in the office. Um, very common things I might have to order and interpret as a PA, a chest x-ray. We see a lot of those, have to order them a lot, especially in the more in the hospital setting. Um, with patients, if we're worried about a pneumonia or we're worried about um, if we're following them for rib fractures, all that kind of stuff. Um, everything you will learn at, in PA school and on the job. Um, some of the common labs we might see, order and interpret. We see a lot of CT scans of the abdomen in the general surgery field. Um, things that you learn a little bit about, but it really takes time and um, just making sure that you're taking a look as many of the scans as you can to get better and better at reading them. Um, that's another link also to a IND taken from my Instagram page, a common procedure we might do in the office or even at the hospital, if it's a big one, we might have to take them to the operating room to, to do that. Um, tips, advice, I kind of talked about it more in the beginning as well, but I just want everyone to know, um, I know everyone's working hard and it can be hard, it's challenging times. Please keep working hard. I promise it will pay off. Um, it's really hard in your position because you can be like, oh my gosh, I have like six more years or eight more years until like actually could potentially possibly be, you know, a PA. Um, that time goes fast, okay? It doesn't sound, feel like it, um, but it does, you will get through it. And then after it, it goes even faster. Like, it's amazing to me to think that I've been a PA for 10 years and it took me about seven to eight years of planning, um, you know, and working towards my goal of becoming a PA. So it's crazy now that I've actually been a PA longer than I even um, was working towards my goal of becoming a PA. So. Keep working at it. Now we are gonna open it up for a question and answer session. And pre-PA pals are gonna help coordinate this because I wasn't sure how to get to all that. And I figured then they can figure out what questions to ask, more common ones or even interesting ones. I don't, whatever, whatever you guys see yeah. come through. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so there've been a lot of really good questions, but uh, let's start with this one here from Paulina. And she wants to know, did you ever, ever have an incident where the surgeon left the OR to speak with a family while you were closing and the patient started crashing? Uh, if so, how did you deal with that? Uh, crashing, no. Bleeding, yes. Um, you apply pressure when it's bleeding. You learn that pretty early in surgery. And, um, you know, as long as it's not seeking out. So yeah, we Get in, I've gotten into that before, uh, especially with um, when I used to help with a lot of thyroid surgery. Get it, you know, what you do is just, um, I would tell the nurse, uh, page the surgeon stat back to the operating room right now, like I need them. Um, and they'll come back and they're not going to be mad at you if you're paging them appropriately for stat reasons. So, yeah. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. And uh, let's see. Uh, someone asked, what do you think is the hardest part of being a PA? The hardest part, oh goodness, probably getting through the schooling, to be honest with you, sure. getting to your uh, goal. And I still, I don't know what's harder, a pre-PA or actual PA student. It's certainly extremely challenging, but 
but at least when you finally are accepted into PA school, like you're like, okay, I just got to get through this part. You know, you're not waiting to be accepted anymore. So yeah, it's the before part, to be honest with you, you're going to encounter, encounter challenging times, you know, throughout your career, no matter what. Um, but a lot of that is stuff that you actually learn as a pre PA or a PA as you're, going through challenging times now and learning how to cope and learn that you need to continue on with, with life. So. Yeah. As pre-PA students, we definitely feel that. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, uh, in an average day, how many patients would you say you see? Um, well, this morning I rounded on five patients in the hospital and then I had three patients in the office and then I am, might be going to the operating room this afternoon. So it really just kind of depends. So, I mean, if you look at that, I've seen eight today, but might help with up, you know, if it's an operation that's three hours, that's one patient, you know, so. Sure. Um, that's, you know, probably about, about average somewhere around there. Now, if you talk to a PA in family medicine, they might see 25 to 30 patients a day because yeah. they're all 15 minute appointments, so. Okay, and um, let's see, somebody asked uh, your opinion on the ongoing discussion about uh, the name change with PA. So I think they're trying to transfer over from physician assistant to physician associate. And yeah, totally. So how do you feel about that? Uh, that's a good question. And I'm really glad that um, even pre-PAs are paying attention to that because sometimes those kind of things actually come up in interviews, like what's something that's being discussed about the profession and that's been an ongoing conversation, honestly, since I was a pre-PA. Um, I like the term PA, you know, I don't like the term assistant, even though, to be honest with you, in the surgery world, in the operating room, we are more, we are an assistant in the operating room. Um, outside of that, we're helping the surgeons a lot, but I'm also, you know, doing a lot of practicing with autonomy and I haven't even seen the surgeon in like, I don't know, a few hours. I've been seeing all my patients in clinic alone. Um, I don't know. I don't feel super strongly either way, to be honest with you. I'm, it's not going to change what I, what I do or um, my day-to-day -day as far as if the name change goes. So sure. other people might feel strongly about it. Okay. And uh, let's see, Jasper is asking, as your first PA job, how long did it take you to earn the trust of the surgeon? That gets a little better every year. <laughs> I say year because it does, you know, it takes a long time to be honest with you. Um, but I feel like I was given tasks pretty early that definitely pushed me out of my comfort zone. Um, and sometimes I would say, no, no, don't leave yet. Like, and sometimes, you know, after I had done it a time or two with, with them and they trusted me. Um, so it's, it's not one of those things where you just wake up one day and you have complete trust or complete faith in yourself that you can do something. Um, it gets better with time. Definitely, I would say most surgical PAs, it takes a good four to five years to really be like, okay, I really got this down. I'm probably um, have seen the most improvement these four or five years compared to what I will the next four to five years, I guess you could say, with this, okay. as far as skill set goes. So, so ongoing. Uh, totally. <laughs> um, let's see. So uh, in your opinion, what are some qualities which you find very important for your profession? So as a PA. That's a good, um, that's a really good uh, question. I would say PAs have to be um, adaptable. You cannot expect to be, like I said, um, the leader or final say in everything. You have to have leadership qualities because, I mean, I'm getting asked constantly questions, you know, by other professions, nurses, stuff like that. Um, so you have to show some leadership quality, but um, you're also working under the supervision of a physician. So, um, you know, you have to be okay with not being the final absolute say in everything. Always speak up, of course, if you think it's a patient safety issue or if maybe you notice something that the physician did not. And I am an advocate of that because I've certainly picked up things that 
maybe they didn't see vice versa. Um, so that's important being obviously very compassionate with people, enjoying being around people, having excellent communication skills is really important. Um, as far as personalities go, you can be introvert, you can be extrovert. It, that doesn't really matter. You can still do everything that it requires for the PA profession based on those types of personalities. Um, do not be someone though who you know prefers to just be in front of a computer all day not communicating with people or interacting. Um, you can get pretty tired at the end of the day, especially for me if, if, if I'm in a busy clinic day and seeing lots of patients and talking all day it's like my brain's tired you know so, yeah yeah um let's see so somebody is asking do you feel like you have any limit limitations as a pa well we're not physicians we're never gonna um be the you know person in the operating room calling every shot and stuff like that um but that's also not our profession so i wouldn't say it's a limitation um Hmm. There are certain things, like I say, it takes time to build trust. Um, so there's certain things that I can do that sometimes the surgeon might prefer to do themselves, which you have to be okay with until, you know, usually I um, take the time or put it lightly, like, I'm very happy to help you with that. I have done that before, um, but, you know, completely respect if you just prefer to do it yourself. So you'll run into that and you have to be okay with it. But I feel like the more they know that you, sometimes they might not know if you can do it or have done it. So you kind of have to speak up and advocate for yourself as well um, and let them know kind of where you're at. Same thing goes like with like my PA students when they come in, like I don't always know what they've done. I, sometimes I'm asking them like, have you ever removed staples? Have you ever removed sutures yet? Like, do I need to walk you through this or can you do it? You know, so you have to, speak up at that and let them know where you're at so right okay and uh let's see somebody else is asking do you have a favorite procedure in the OR um I have a few most of mine tend to be the bigger abdominal operations that I enjoy um I like a good um colon resection sigmoidectomy um I used to help with a lot of liver surgery I really enjoyed that um adrenalectomies, removing the adrenal glands. Those are fun. Um, yeah, those are probably the big, the big ones I'd say. Okay, perfect. And let's see, we're getting kind of close to one. So how do you feel yeah. about one more We're question? actually doing okay. Let's do like, at least let's do like, if there's like five more minutes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Um, how do you feel about dealing with medical residents who are just starting out? Do they want to learn from you or do they only want to learn from other doctors? That's a good question. I do not um, have surgical residents where I work. Um, so it's the surgeons and the PAs in our department. Um, we have family practice residents that join us on rotation. Um, I'd say most of them are pretty happy when I like give them some tips on suturing and helping them, um, you know, with needle driver hand handling skills and um, tying and all that stuff. They're usually welcome um, to my advice. They know, you know, they, it's pretty clear to them within, the, you know, two minutes of suturing next to each other that I may have been doing this longer than they have. Um, but I don't have surgical residents that I work with. Awesome. And I don't know, I talk to people who work with them. It's just kind of hit or miss on their, you know, if they're on their attitude, if they respect their, um, you know, experiences, or if they prefer to just learn from the surgeon. So. Right. But you're gonna have to work together as a team regardless. <laughs> right, okay, let's see. Um, have you ever encountered a patient or family member who refused to be seen by you because you were not a physician? And if so, how did you respond? Um, yeah, most of the time this is, sorted out beforehand luckily not like on the spot because um it might be like a phone call saying you're gonna follow up with a physician assistant and they say absolutely not um if they absolutely want to see the surgeon 
um, that's fine. Because at the same time, you have to remember if they really don't want to see you, um, it can become like a liability issue if, you know, you're already starting out behind. Um, luckily, I'd say it happens a lot less now compared to when I started out because people are much more familiar with the profession, um, which is awesome. In the hospital, it's kind of a different story when I, do, I certainly have do encounter it from time to time. I don't know how often, maybe once, maybe twice a year, not that much, um, where I might go in and say, I'm a physician assistant. I work with the surgeon. I'm here to see you this morning. And they say, well, I want, I want the surgeon. I say, okay, that's fine. But just so you know, they're in the operating room for the next um, three hours. So um, I'm happy to help you now. Um, or if you want to wait for them for, I don't know how many hours you certainly can. Um, and most of the time they're like, well, what, what do you know? What can you help me with? Can, can you switch my pain meds? I'm like, well, of course I can do that. You know, it's most of it is just not being familiar with what we can do and manage and treat. So, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, let's see. Somebody is asking, is not tying hard? Uh, they said, for instance, square knots. And is there a lot of opportunity to practice that kind of thing during PA school or should you look for experience outside? Um, a lot of that's going to be independent practice once you learn how to do it. A lot of people, the more videos that come out, I have some videos on my IGTV of it. I did my best to try and describe it. Um, I usually help my students with it. Um, once you got it down, you just have to practice. You can sit in front of the TV and practice and get better and better at it. So I was um, taught how to do it by a surgical resident in PA school. And I mastered it by the time I, not mastered, but I was pretty darn good at it. I feel like by the time I was on rotation because I had practiced so much before. Awesome. It just takes practice, like everything, it's like okay. tying your shoes. You never know how to do that until you learn it. Now it's easy. So yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. So someone is saying, if you had to choose another specialty, what would you choose? Um, I kind of like the acute hospital stuff. Um, if it wasn't another surgical specialty, probably something like emergency medicine. I like the kind of fast paced type, lots of, you know, procedures and yeah. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. I'm actually considering that myself. I I'm with you. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, um, kind of getting towards the end of the questions here, but someone's asking, how's the transition if you do decide to switch specialty after you've been in something? Uh, is it a smooth transition or is it kind of difficult? I'd say it depends how different the specialty is. Um, it's challenging. You definitely have to prepare to um, be a little uncomfortable and really studying a lot for probably the next year. I see. So it's not a, you know, I mean, it comes up at, with a lot of people in their career at some point, but um, you have to probably do it at hopefully a good time in your life where you can commit a lot of time to really studying. We recently had a PA who switched from family practice three years to general surgery. Um, and she's been here for about a year and a half now. And, um, I still, you know, help her with a lot of things. If she's not comfortable doing a procedure, she'll grab me and just have me watch her and just be there in case she needs something. Um, you know, still a lot of studying, reviewing before cases and stuff like that. Um, so, which we all do. I still will read up if I haven't done a um, case in a while. I'll take time to review it beforehand just to refresh myself. Okay, perfect. And uh, let's see, somebody is asking, how many surgeons do you work with? Uh, I know that some PAs can be just directly under one supervising physician or if they have mm -hmm. multiple, if they're employed. Yeah. So our group has seven surgeons and four PAs. Um, right now we have one PA out on leave. So there's three of us for seven surgeons. Um, so I'm covering two surgeons right now. Um, so usually it's one to two. If it gets to be more than that, it's pretty challenging to really be able to help any of them from time to time. And even at times, like if they both need me right in the morning, I kind of have to prioritize what, who needs my help more basically. I see. <laughs> so, yeah. so that decision is, is up to you who you decide on helping. 
uh, I'd say for the most part, if it's reasonable, they're going to be like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Like, yeah, you should probably go help with that procedure. And I can see these, you know, couple patients left on the list or something like that. And so, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. Are we still doing okay on time? Um, yeah, maybe just like two more questions. Two more questions? Okay, perfect. Yeah. So uh, someone said they're interesting. In, they're interested in trauma and oncology surgery. And they said, do you find it challenging to do both given that they're a bit, they're a bit different? Yeah, that would be hard to honestly find a position that has both. Like, um, because oncology, um, so a lot of general surgeons take care of patients with cancer. Um, a surgical oncologist is usually fellowship trained if you're trying to get into a specialty of just taking care of um, cancer patients surgically, that's a specialty. And then um, trauma is a completely different specialty where some surgeons are fellowship trained in that. So um, you pretty much have to be at a smaller community hospital that might have PAs doing both. You're not going to find that um, at a um, big institution because those departments are going to all be completely separate. Okay, awesome. And let's see one last question. Um, what would you say is your favorite and least favorite part of your job? Um, I guess my favorite part is um, I really enjoy operating on people, helping with their operations and then seeing them get better. And then I love like seeing them back in the office and being like, oh my gosh, you look great. Like I barely recognize you. I haven't even met you without a hospital gown on and stuff. So oh, it must really be a good feeling. Reporting and and being able to give them, um, lots of times we follow up with the pathology too, um, giving them nice results as far as, well, it looks like, you know, we got all that cancer out and the margins look good and um, kind of planning from there as far as now do they need to go on to see oncology or are we good, um, stuff like that. So that's really rewarding to see. Awesome. <laughs> and then um, I think I mentioned some of my least favorite as far as, um, you know, when you are in the operating room, you're kind of disconnected from the whole world. Yeah. You know, you don't have your cell phone on you. The nurses can page you, but like you have no idea um, what's going on. I, I've literally like um, stepped out of the operating room after like six hours and someone's like, oh, it, and walk out to my car and realize it snowed like a foot. I'm like, oh, I didn't even know it was snowing. Apparently it snowed. <laughs> like you have no idea what's going on. It's just like a whole different world. So, oh. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, well, all right, Katie, thank you so much for doing this. We sincerely appreciate it. Like, yeah, an amazing session. absolutely. And, um, you know, I'm always happy. I try and get through all the questions I can that come through, like um, my messages on Instagram. So if you have any further ones that you can think of, um, please, you know, send me a message and I'll do my best. I, sometimes I'll just try and get through them all like once a week or something. Um, and do my best to answer them. Um, I've obviously been on a PA school now for 10 years, so I can't say I'm the best person to ask if you have specifics about different classes to take, um, but more about like the PA profession and being surgery PA. Um, I love, um, I do a lot um, of communicating with students on rotation and they're like having challenges throughout their rotation. Um, and then asking me for advice, like, oh gosh, I haven't even been able to suture yet. Like, you know, just stuff that comes up like that. So I sure. enjoy it. <laughs> it's gonna be a great opportunity for you guys. So we'll definitely make sure to link your Instagram in the chat if we wanna take you up on that. Yeah, that'd be great. But thank you so much again. Hopefully you have time to eat. I know you spent your lunch break with us. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I think we'll be okay. Otherwise, you know, it's nothing new to me. <laughs> okay. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. And thanks for arranging this. This is great. Absolutely. Our pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Have Bye. a great day. Okay. Awesome. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for attending. We're about to drop the quiz in the chat right now. Um, we'll be hanging around. If you have any questions, you can just ask us directly in the chat. Uh, we do have a session coming up on Sunday, which should be a little something different. 
Um, so this gentleman just finished PA school, so he's a lot closer to the application process, uh, classes and all that kind of stuff. And he actually does mentoring for students uh, who are trying to get into PA school or are in PA school. So very close to students and uh, he'll have a lot of good info, info on that. He's also offering a uh, sheet of some sort. What was that? Yeah, it is a, sorry, let me find it here. Oh gosh. I'm just telling about it. Um, it's a guide you can take for becoming a more competitive applicant. And he's gonna be discussing a lot of those type of things, how you can make your application better, and he'll be discussing discussing things like mentorship, things like that. Yeah, so we will be sure to provide anybody who attends that session with that guide. Um, like we said, he, he's very close to the application process, and he does this kind of like as a hobby. He likes helping students that he sees are motivated help get in. So this is a guide that he compiled with all of his knowledge and expertise around the subject. So yeah, definitely guys, stay tuned with us. We uh, will have that one on Sunday and then immediately after way more sessions. And well, like we said, we try and do different specialty every time. Um, so, you know, just the broadest experience for you guys, whatever we can get for you. Um, but yeah, I think that's everything. Thank you so much, everybody. We really appreciate it. We'll be right here if you have any questions, okay? Um, actually, we do have oh. some more information about the quiz. So as always, it'll be four, actually, no, it'll be five multiple choice questions. You have to get four out of five correct to be emailed their certificate. Um, the quiz is only open for an hour, and we did send that link out in the chat, and it's pinned at the top if you can't see that. So that should be everything. Okay. Awesome, y'all. We'll hang out right here. If you want to ask us anything, just let us know. All right. Thank, thank you so you. much again.